Thank you. Well, that was nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's interesting. I, I have um, spoken with each of you many times mm. over the years, but never together. Right. Mm. And so, Ken, I think you were the instigator of this get together. Mm. Why did you want to have this conversation, and why now? Well, first of all, I've known Skip for a quarter of a century and love him. Uh, but after the massacres in Charleston last June, um, and then after the sort of denouement where the Confederate flag was removed from the State House grounds in Columbia, uh, we'd already been in touch, both of us, with uh, ex-Mayor uh, Joe Riley, then Mayor Joe Riley, in Charleston about what we could do, how we could help, and, and we're all continuing to do that. But I was disappointed by the fact that there was seemed to be a palpable sense of relief that we no longer had to talk about race again, which is something that has been in almost every film that I've done. That if you're going to study American history, you're going to bump up with the question of race in America and, and, and racism. And I reached out to uh, Mayor Riley and said, you know, I want to continue the conversation. It's really important that a symbol like the Confederate flag had been removed. Symbols are hugely important, particularly in our republic, but we need to do better than that. You know, the sales of Confederate flags just skyrocketed right afterwards. And so he said, well, come down. Let's have a conversation about race. And I said, well, I'm not going to come alone. And that, um, you know. <laughs> this is the muscle. So I, I wanted to bring my, my, my backup and, and my muscle. And, so we, <laughs> we started in, in early December in, in Charleston, and we had at the Guyard Center, you know, 1,800 people, um, a, a really good conversation. And we showed clips from both of our films, and we felt like you couldn't really measure have you advanced the conversation, but you felt like you could really open it up. And people, it was a diverse crowd as there is tonight, and we took it to uh, Pasadena, and then we took it to South by Southwest on Saturday night in Austin. We did two things Monday at uh, the National Press Club and then at George Washington University on Monday night. And, and we're here ending it appropriately in the place where this extraordinary experiment of bringing Jackie Robinson up, uh, but one of the great cities on earth, Brooklyn, uh, and, my and birthplace. All right. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> and why did you say yes? Well, it was something of a, a healing gesture um, for, for Charleston. I had interviewed Reverend Pinckney for Many Rivers to Cross, and we used him in the trailer. And, and I was, does everyone know who Reverend Pinckney is? Reverend Pinckney was the minister who was murdered. Um, at Mother you know, Emanuel. At Mother Emanuel. And um, so I went to bed. I heard about this terrible thing. And I was on a flight to California the next day. And um, our senior producer, Sako Glasgow, who's here, emailed me and said, you realize that a guy we interviewed was murdered? And I went, oh, my God. And um, it put a face on the, um, the heinous nature of the evil. I mean, it's bad enough, but if you actually know somebody. So we quickly, we got the footage out. I wrote an op-ed page piece for the Times, all this on a plane going to California. Um, we edited the interview, and then Ken approached me about this and just said that it was tearing him up and he wanted to do something. And meanwhile, I had some friends, anonymous friends here in New York, who wanted to do something, and they ended up in about three days of putting up three and a half million dollars in scholarship funds for the children of the survivors of Mother Emanuel. So when Ken asked me, I thought, this is something that I could do um, in tribute to Reverend um, Pinckney. And that's how it started. And when we did this event in Charleston, uh, 1,800 people came. And you could see that it was um, important to that community. People don't realize how black South Carolina was. 48% of all the slaves of our African-American ancestors who came into the United States enslaved came in through the port of Charleston, 48%. There were so many black people in South Carolina. My family's from South Carolina. Huh, really? Mm -hmm. Its nickname was Negro Country. 
which is one reason it's so crazy about in, in terms of race and race relations, because there were so many black people in one of the most famous rebellions ever in the history of American slavery was the Stono Rebellion in 1739. So all these mechanisms of control and repression. South Carolina is a special, a special case. All those crazy stories that Isabel Wilkerson writes about in her mm -hmm. book, The Warmth of Other Suns, like black people and white people can't play checkers together. Mm -hmm. um, true. Black mm -hmm. people can't own guns. Black people have to be in certain places at certain times. All that from And South it was Carolina. because of the numbers. Mm -hmm because they were outnumbered as far as they were concerned. And there, there was this paranoia. But um, you could, Ken and I were part of this uh, a ritual of exorcism, right. this collective grief. And it was very moving to me. And we had no idea, we could have no idea, that when we agreed to do this, that by spring, Donald Trump would be the putative you know, well, you know, nominee to, of the Republican Party. To, to that Party. end, I'm glad you brought him up because, I, 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 because words. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, I think. <laughs> I, think I think we'll be chatting a, a bit about Indeed. what's happening now. But, but the whole point of words and how words are being used, I do have to ask each of you if you really ever thought that you would see in your lifetimes people using words the way they're being used now in the I, context of I think of a in the history election. of the United States, we, we, we assume, we presume, we hope uh, that it is a, a rising road that is steadily rising. And we have made progress. But I think in a country in which words actually matter, as they do in the United States, and more importantly, their dangerous progeny ideas, um, we can also become susceptible to the way they've been misused. And I think what we've seen just in the last year since Charleston has been a perverted sense of who we are. We're getting away. I mean, we used to say in the, in the media and the press, uh, dog whistle. It's no longer dog whistle. Dog whistle's at a frequency that only a few people can hear. These are out and out, in, you know, crying fire in an open theater right now that's mm -hmm. happening with the words. And so as Sarah uh, Burns and David McMahon and I were finishing our film on Jackie Robinson last summer, trying to unpack Charleston and the grief and, mm -hmm. and, and how palpably we all felt it, uh, and, and dealing with the story of Jackie Robinson, who though lives somehow in another era, everything was current. I mean, here was Confederate flag issues and driving while black and stop and frisk and, and uh, black church and Black Lives Matters and all of the things that, that we think are sort of contemporary now, I suddenly realized that Jackie might offer some help. It was a voice from the past that might provide us with a calmer table around which we could have a civil discourse because clearly that discourse has deteriorated where now it takes uh, a presidential candidate 24 hours to suddenly realize that he should distance himself from the Ku Klux Klan and, and David Duke <laughs> and white supremacy, a very calculated one, which is like Republican establishment is supposedly freaked out about this, this is something new, but Ronald Reagan began his mm -hmm. campaign in 1980 in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where the three civil rights workers had been slain, and he said, I am for states' rights. That's mm -hmm. the first thing he said, which was the wink-wink, just as the period between the conversation with Jake Tapper and, and, and Trump's ultimate repudiation of, of uh, David Duke and the Klan and white supremacy took that long. You were we saying thought. you didn't think that you were you are surprised or you oh yeah are I mean I'm a, at this stage of I'm a child of the 60s mm -hmm. and you, I mean you, you remember that we thought this is the last year our generation is different the old generation right. um, once they go the petty forms of American apartheid will will disappear all right then people forgot that then Barack Obama is elected. Remember all those theories of post-racial America? I even had a colleague who wrote a book called The End of Black Literature because a right. black man was in the White House. Hello? Can I have an instant replay of that moment? I missed that era. Yeah. Well, we talk about the, uh, the Onion magazine headline in <laughs> yeah. his inaugural was Black Man Given Worst Job in the World. And the friends of mine who said, now will you stop talking about race? I said, just watch. Mm -hmm. and, and it... And Did people really say that to you? Oh, oh you well, first of all, I've, I've gotten These are a great deal of hate mail all the <laughs> way through about dealing with race. And, uh, and then I have friends who say, why do you keep bringing it up? And, and people who ask, and even scholars who say, why do you keep bringing this up? And I said, it's, it's American history. I, I'm not looking for it. It's just there in every essence. We put black history into February, our coldest, shortest, and darkest month, as if it's some <laughs> politically correct addenda 
to our national narrative when it's actually at the burning heart of who we are. It's our original sin when we inherit the, the hypocrisy of all men are created equal, written by Thomas Jefferson, who says, oh, thank you, Sally. Yeah, oh, thank you, Jacob. You know, uh, you know that's, what, that's what happens. This is the America that we have. So when he was elected, I knew that most of us want to believe. When the president sang at the, at the memorial service in Charleston, he sang Amazing Grace. That was the better angels of our nature. That was us projecting ourselves to our best selves and saying, this is who we really are. But there's also a subset of that. Not a majority, I'm happy to say, but people who are disturbed by the old guilts that Robert Penn Warren called the Civil War and want that can't stand living side cheek by jowl with African Americans and so have to make these rules. We posted, PBS posted a small segment of the President and First Lady uh, talking about Jackie and, and Rachel and how Jackie wouldn't be there without Rachel Robinson, as you'll see. And they put it up about a week ago. If you go on their Twitter feed, you can look at it. It's a wonderful, very moving, funny mm -hmm. scene and very human. But if you go on the Twitter feed, you cannot believe that we are in the 21st century, that we are in 2016. The comments are what you'd expect mm -hmm. in Jim Crow, 1880, mm -hmm. Macon, Georgia. And well, speaking of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. there is um, the Jim Crow Museum at Ferris State University right. in Michigan. And we film there for many rivers to cross. Uh, and I'm, there are two kinds of black people. The way, either you think that the Sambo <laughs> art, and at least two kinds of black people. Right, I thought there were, 40, I thought there were I thought, 42 million kinds yeah, we'll, of... There, we'll get to that. There's, <laughs> but, some, there's some more, but yeah. go ahead. I take, go ahead. When, when, it <laughs> when it comes to racist uh, imagery of black people, there, there are two kinds. You know, either you collect it and you, you think that um, by collecting it, you can explicate it. And if you can explicate it, you can exercise it. And then there are other people who think it should all be part of a big bonfire and destroyed. And there is um, David Pilgrim is a scholar, and he's created the world's first Jim Crow Museum. And when we filmed there, what, two years ago, three years ago, already there wasn't exactly a wing dedicated to Barack Obama and racist imagery of the president, but there was a whole section which is just with the vilest, sexually demeaning, just things I don't even want to say out loud. And it was just... Somehow, electing a black man, putting a black man in the White House just disturbed a lot of people. It, no, it didn't disturb. It flipped some people completely out. Do, do you out. think that words, your words, will matter in this current environment? Oh, you have to believe that. I mean, when I, I'm a, a student of African American history, as you know, and one of the things that I tell my students is that um, our ancestors. Imagine, you know, in 1860, in the 1860 census, Ken, 90% of our ancestors were enslaved. And these are people living in a slave cabin in one room, right, with their children in one room. And there is no promise, no guarantee that slavery would be abolished. But they, they believed. You know, they believed a better time was coming. They believed, think of all the phrases in African-American discord. They made a way out of, out of no way, hope against hope. They believed that one day you would be sitting here, I would be sitting here, a white man would take as part of his subtext for his corpus of brilliant works, race in the presence of black people. They believed that. And they, somehow, where did they get the faith? Where did they get the hope? How could we have any excuse not to believe in the future if our ancestors put up with all that shit from slavery? All right. Well, to that end, though... Well, this seems like a good place to start bringing in. You both have new films coming out. Um, Ken's yours is first, and then yours is coming out when? In the fall. In the fall. Yours is coming out in April, April 11th, 11th and 12th. And 12th pr produced along with... Sarah Burns and Dave who's, McMahon, who's, who's, who's here, hopefully audience, she's right? here. So, so we're, going to, we're going to play some clips throughout our conversation this evening. I think this is a really good place to start because, mm -hmm. it's, because clearly you believe that the truth does matter, at mm -hmm. least to some people, yeah, yeah. and that knowing the history uh, does matter to some people. So I want to play to a clip. There'll be a clip from each of your films. And this one, I will, I'll, I'm going to play the clip first. But before we play the, the clip, I do want to ask you, why Jackie Robinson and why now? Well, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, we had covered him significantly in my 1994 uh, 
ten, you know, nine episode, 18 and a half hour series on the history of baseball. He was in nearly every episode and we'd done a good job on it. And his widow, Rachel, who's now 93, began mm. speaking to me, you know, a, more than a dozen years ago, asking for a standalone one. Would I do that? And I said, he certainly des deserves it, but we were busy and Sarah and Dave and I finished the film on the Central Park Five and said yes, wholeheartedly. And one of the reasons is, he is the most important person in the history of baseball. I would say in the history of American sports. He is the beginning of the modern civil rights era. He's not the first civil rights activist in the 20th century, but when you realize on April 15th, 1947, when he walked out on a ball field to play first base at Ebbets Field, not too far from here, uh, Martin Luther King was still a junior at Morehouse College. Harry Truman hadn't integrated the military. There were no organized sit-ins and lunch counters except when Jackie was a teenager and refused to get up. And uh, Rose Parks was still a decade away from refusing to give up her seat on a Montgomery uh, bus, though Jackie had done it three years before at Fort Hood, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, Brown versus Board of Education hadn't declared that segregating school children according to race and color uh, was, you know, was no longer constitutional. And so you begin to realize, as Dr. King said, that Jackie Robinson was a sit-inner before sit-ins and a freedom rider before freedom rides. But as I said before, almost every aspect of his life, once you'd, once you'd scraped away the barnacles of mythology, Mythology and the sentimentality, the children's book stuff about this very passive black man who turned the other cheek and made it possible to go through. Once you took out the sort of dominant, sort of patronizing view of Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Dodgers, reaching down like God and bestowing on his son, Jesus, this role of the first one, once you understood the dynamics of an active black press pressing for decades, once you understood that there was a left-wing press, uh, including the communist daily worker pressing for it, that Fiorello LaGuardia, a left-leaning meaning Republican mm -hmm. mayor of New York. I'm not going crazy. That actually <laughs> happened. Um, and uh, you know, other forces that people were are going to be googling right now. They're like, the what? Ja the Jackie Jackie Robinson. Um, you know, becomes both this beautiful accident, but suddenly he's no longer a statue out in the park collecting pigeon shit. He's a real d dynamic human being. That this is a, a portrait of a multi-generational African-American family, a beautiful love story that's not perfect. There's, there's tensions in it. And that it was possible to invest in the story of Jackie, new life, new dimensions, new complexity that doesn't in any way diminish him in a revisionist fact. In fact, makes him more inspiring because he's not this perfect being. And so the film is an attempt to show an more, uh, in greater depth, as, as Sarah and Dave and I wish to do, an important figure that I think has somehow, you know, receded into kind of two-dimensionality. If we think George Washington had wooden teeth, he didn't, then we understand <laughs> that anybody's susceptible to that kind of erasure, that time and conventional wisdom and the subtle manipulations, and I would suggest racial manipulations, that what we focus on is when Jackie was a good Negro and when he was no longer had to turn the other cheek and he began to speak out and argue with umpires, he was suddenly, in his words, uppity. Let's play, let's play the clips now, mm -hmm. and then the first, the first clip you see will be from Ken's film, and then the second clip you see will be from Skip's film, and I'm going to have you talk out of it and tell us a little bit more about it, okay. and let's hear it. So let's watch. It was my mother's idea. We would have had a small wedding and been finished with it. She wanted me to have the gown, the biggest church in Los Angeles, and all the flowers and everything. I put a dress away at Saks Fifth Avenue and paid on it for a year before I could afford to take it out. But we did have a grand wedding. On February 10th, 1946, Jackie and Rachel were married at the Independent Church of Christ in Los Angeles. A few weeks later, the newlyweds prepared to leave for spring training in Daytona Beach, Florida, where Jackie was to try out for the Montreal Royals. Branch Rickey had invited Rachel to join him there, the only wife allowed at Dodgers camp. They were to fly to Daytona Beach with stopovers in New Orleans and Pensacola, Florida along the way. We never really had a honeymoon. We went to our first spring training on our honeymoon. It was terrible. We were bumped from two planes to getting there. And fortunately, Mally had met us at the airport with a shoebox full of fried chicken, and she said, take this on with you. You may need it. We were embarrassed. 
We were bumped in New Orleans. We were bumped in Pensacola, Florida. And white passengers were put on in our place. I had never seen signs on restrooms, on water faucets, and that kind of thing. So I went into the ladies, white ladies' bathroom just so I could recover, recover my own sense of myself. And I walked into there and did what I had to do and nodded at the ladies and walked out. We finally took a bus to spring training from Jacksonville on our honeymoon. We went to the back of the bus. And when it got dark, I started to cry because I had felt my great husband, who had been a fighter and a dignified person, had been reduced by discrimination and by segregation. And he had sort of caved in to what the society wanted in the South. But the fried chicken was great. In the spring of 1965, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, sent teams of activists to rural Lowndes County, Alabama. Among them was a charismatic 23-year-old named Stokely Carmichael. We have to use our vote to get out the cotton fields. See? That's right. And we can't, we can't get out the cotton field voting for the boss, man. That's right. Out of it. We got to vote for people who've been in the cotton fields like ourselves, and they're the ones who are going to bring us out of the cotton field. At first, Carmichael had trouble convincing black residents to join him because so many were terrified of the white landowners who controlled just about every aspect of their lives. The rivers and roadsides here were dotted with the bodies of men and women who had dared to stand up for civil rights. The county was nicknamed Bloody Lounds. Anyone who even talked about black people voting was taking an enormous risk. Help me to understand how people felt when they were approached by SNCC at the beginning. They were afraid and they thought that uh, they would be killed and they were frightened for their family. John Jackson grew up in Lowndes County. He was 16 years old when Stokely arrived and was one of the few to welcome him. I was a student at that time and I saw those civil rights workers. So I was excited and they said, well, we're looking for a place to stay in the community so we can organize Lowndes County. I said, well, my father got a vacant house down there. I said, y'all come on down and meet him. But you volunteered your parents' house? Yeah. I said, come talk to Daddy. He might let y'all stay in the house. Wow. Did, uh, and, when you went home and told your father, did he say, are you crazy, boy? No, he didn't. <laughs> he said, well, let him come on down, fellas, and we'll see what we can do. Uh huh. So they came down to meet him, and they hit right off. Huh. And he told them, there's no inside bathroom. These are substandard houses. Are you cats going to stay in there? Yeah, Mr. Jack, we just need somewhere to stay because these folks shooting at us. <laughs> <laughs> How did your white neighbors? react to Stokely and the SNCC activists? After they found out they were really here, they called my daddy and told him, you don't need them now, mm -hmm. But he said to them, well, I just want it better for my children. Mm -hmm. So they're going to continue to stay down there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I think I think we all loved Rachel's face when she talked about her. Honey. We all love that look on her face. Ma didn't Mally we? is uh, mm -hmm. Jackie's mother, mm -hmm. and she knows she has moved her family from Cairo, Georgia, where real Jim Crow, to Pasadena, where they've experienced another kind of more uh, covert racism, but but pretty dramatic as well. Cross burnings and don't move next door to me, that sort of thing. And so she knows, and I think there's something hopeful as 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 Skip was talking about, you know, that, that they were married. Here was this experiment that was possibly going to take place. They are going to go try out for the farm club of the Dodgers, the Montreal Royals. And, um, but she understood what could happen when you went down south, and so the chicken was produced. That embarrassed them. And I think at the end of the story, the moral of the story is that Rachel realized what Mally knew and sort of took in uh, the sense of wisdom embodied in a box of fried chicken. It, it might have embarrassed her, but she didn't throw the fried chicken. No, she, she did not. That's why, I know, that's why we all like that chicken was good. Yeah, yeah she knew what was up. So talk to me, talk us, tell us a little bit about your film. Well, um, 
I was um, at the end of a cycle with PBS thinking about what, what's next, after Many Rivers Across. And we had done 500 years of African American history. So what do you do next? So I made a list of 10 projects. And my partner, Dylan McGee, is here. Uh, and I were, you know, brainstorming. And, you know, you, you, if you're blessed with good friends, you should take advantage of your friends, good, smart friends. And so I went to um, one of my friends, a guy I admire, named happens to be Ken Chenault. And you know who he is, most people know. He's the CEO of American Express. Same generation. Um, we overlapped in a lot of ways. In fact, his two sons were students in my lecture course at Harvard. So I went down to American Express headquarters. And, um, you didn't I, call to say your bill was late, right? Was late <laughs> See, what happened was that... What, yeah, what had happened what was... What had happened was... When black people are lying, they say, what had happened was... What had happened was... was, see, was. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that conversation. It wasn't that conversation. Okay, <laughs> all right, because that so would have been mine, but... Yeah, I, go ahead. I, I <laughs> asked him for, uh, you know, could I have 15 minutes? 15 minutes with one of the smartest people on the planet. And I know he, he expected me to ask him for money, sponsorship, for, but I didn't. I said, all I want is your opinion. What should we do next? Now, at the top of my list was the great civilizations of Africa. Um, because one of the worst aspects of slavery, not only were our ancestors persons and personhood stolen, but our stories were stolen. And that was, that's a terrible, terrible thing. And um, Africa still, um, unfortunately, for many people, is uh, just a version of Tarzan stereotypes. So I wanted to go back and tell 5,000 years of African history. And that's what we're filming right now. I'm just back from Africa. And in three weeks, I'll go back to Africa and film on the continent. Um, so he looked at the list and said, you got to do Africa. He said, but the second most important one is not on the list, number 11. I said, what? He said, you and I were born about the same time I was born in 1950. He said, you have to tell our story. You have to tell the story of the last 50 years of African American history. And you know what? I looked at him. It was a, 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 um, an epiphany. It was like a bolt of lightning. I went, I never would have thought of that because it's my story. It's our story. So the conceit of this film is, what would, if MLK woke up, or Malcolm, Malcolm's killed in 65, MLK in 68. And they said, what's been happening, you know, in the last, <laughs> what would you say? And so that's what we're, we're doing. We, we take it from um, the passage of the Voting Rights Act up until, well, well, I was going to say up until the, the re-election of Barack Obama or the second inauguration. But we've recently decided that events since um, last fall are so momentous with the origins of Donald Trump and this political campaign that we're going to, that's why we're not showing in April, but we're going to add a coda and we're really going to, I, I haven't uh, told are anybody else. Are you going to before the election or after the election? Uh, well, we're going to cut it to, it'll be after the election. And mm -hmm. also, but I also want to add the opening of the African American Museum on the Mall. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really, it's a really. signal moment. Yeah, signal. And but to, uh, as Ken was saying, and as you were saying, did we ever think a candidate, since George Wallace could get away with certain kinds of language um, and run for, for office, and a person who probably um, was a center of the road person before he decided to be president, the answer in my lifetime is no, and particularly after Barack Obama. So I'm riveted by this uh, phenomenon of, of uh, Donald Trump, and we want to take it from the passage of the Voting Rights Act to whatever is about to unfold in the general election. One of the things that's been interesting about looking at your films, the, the, the sections that you've made available to us, and, and, and Ken, your film as well, is going back, toggling back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know how to say this. It was unexpectedly... Um, Disturbing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I disturbing think in a way that, and the next I think section that we want to play mm -hmm. um, speaks to this whole question because okay. obviously one of the enduring challenges, issues for people of color, has been the relationship with state authority. Yes. Mm -hmm. However, it manifests itself, mm -hmm. or even when it isn't state authority but claims the authority of the state to its own ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and so, 
This is which has worked that, positively and negatively right. for our That's people. Right. right? Well, I'm interested in your take on that. Um, do you want to play the clips first? Or do you want to tell no, me more, about, play, what you no, let's tell play me more about what you, why you say that? Because when I said that, claiming the authority of the state to its own ends, I'm thinking Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman. Yes. No, but I was and thinking. And I was wondering of, what you're thinking. I was thinking of uh, Brown v. Board. Yeah. Okay. So you know, there were times when small groups of people did what was right, and, and if, if there had been a referendum on integrating schools in 1954, it never would have passed. But it was a nine to, to nothing. Uh, unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. I was thinking of things like that. Mm -hmm. Which other people would call judicial activism. Yes. Yeah. And which they are now trying to... To... Eliminate. Eliminate. Completely. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's, so let's play it. this next set of clips, <laughs> um, which speaks in its, each in its own way, speaks to this whole question of the relationship of the state to the person. Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, are we ready? Let's play those. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In early 1943, the club's directors pledged their support to Ricky's plan to integrate the Dodgers. Ricky immediately instructed his scouts to begin searching for the right man. Back at Camp Hood, Texas, the 761st Tank Battalion was preparing to go overseas. On the evening of July 6, 1944, one month after Allied forces landed in Normandy, Jackie Robinson boarded a military bus headed to nearby Temple, Texas. He got on the bus on the Army grounds, and he sat next to a woman who looked like she was white. She was a friend of his, and she wasn't white. The bus driver came back and said, moved to the back of the bus, and Jack refused. He said, I will not. I ignored him. I had just seen the Army regulations that had been sent out. No discrimination on any Army vehicle on an Army post in the United States. I refused to allow this civilian to dictate to me where I was going to sit. Everything would have been all right if I had been a Yaza boss type. At the last stop on the base, the bus driver demanded Jackie's identification. A white woman threatened to press charges. Witnesses recalled Jackie swearing at her, but Robinson claimed that he had only told the bus driver, quit fucking with me. The military police arrived and were disrespectful to Robinson. He refused to back down. Think about the number of black men in 1944 who challenged white authority in such a bold way, not just refusing to give up his seat, not just refusing to do what he was told, but to actively stand up and swear at them. The fact that he stood up and he spoke in a very, very aggressive way to the officers that came was extremely threatening uh, and extremely unsettling to the white people who were there. He was very lucky in many respects that he wasn't, um, that it didn't turn violent. Robinson was arrested and charged with insubordination. The trial began on August 2nd, 1944. In his testimony, Jackie admitted that he had threatened a private who had insulted him. If you ever call me a nigger again, I'll break you in two, he'd said. When asked what the word nigger meant, Robinson said, my grandmother was a slave. And she said the definition of the word was a low, uncouth person. I don't consider that I am low and uncouth. I do not consider myself a nigger at all. Jack as a young man always railed against segregation. He always carried himself with a sense of dignity and a sense of purpose in a way that says, I will not be ignored. I will not be denied. What you see at the forefront of Jack's consciousness at all times is the fact that he has a responsibility to the race to do everything possible to ensure that they'll win full equality. And Jack, in that sense, is the quintessential race man. Five days after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, Los Angeles, California exploded.
An altercation between an unarmed black man and the police sparked riots on the streets of Watts, a predominantly black neighborhood, revealing that America still faced deep racial issues. It's so easy to think racism was a Southern problem as opposed to Midwestern, Northern, Western. No, it was a national problem. You had similar conditions, segregated housing, you had segregated schools, you had massive unemployment, massive underemployment, and police brutality, if not downright police terror. He's getting tired of being pushed around by you white people, that's all. You're stopping us on the street, kicking in the doors, taking down the police station, you're kicking your teeth in. Well, they're stopping people on the street now. Oh, yeah, they weren't stopping I'm not people speaking about now. Street, oh, they've been done a long time before now. I think it started 400 years ago. What would make it better? What would make all the rioting stop? I don't think it ever stop, really. Pillage, looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. President Johnson was shocked by the anger in Watts. But Watts was just one spark of a much larger fire. In the coming years, urban unrest roiled cities across America. I remember my father saying it was crazy for people to burn down their own neighborhoods. But African Americans were fed up with segregation, deprivation, and everyday humiliation. They wanted genuine equality. They've been fighting for it for decades, and not enough had changed. When Dr. King visited Watts in the wake of the riots, the frustration was right in front of him. Nobody here is for a riot. Nobody wants to see anybody killed. But who wants to lay down while somebody kick them to death? You all know my philosophy. You all know that I believe firmly in nonviolence. Sure, we, we like to be nonviolent. But we up here in Los Angeles area, we're not turning that other cheek. They are selling us again, and we're tired of being sold as slaves. So, OK. Quick, quick quiz for the audience, and no, I'm not going to grade you. Um, how many here, can we turn the lights up just a teeny bit so I can actually see? Would that be OK? Apologies to our streaming audience. But how many here remembered that Jackie Robinson had actually been arrested before he went into the major leagues? Did anybody remember that? No. Maybe, maybe I see a couple hands here. <laughs> how many remembered that the Watts riots uprising happened five days after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Anybody remember? I see a couple of hands back there. Wow, how is it that we don't re remember, know these things? But I do want to ask you, Skip, obviously I'm going to ask you to sort of talk out of this. What about the present moment strikes you about what we just saw? Well, obviously Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. um, comes to mind of the uh, denunciation or just the, the the, not accusation, but the fact that the man on the street said the police have been abusing us for all this time. This is, this is August of 1965, and no one has done anything about it. Um, and not a few people have noted that the fact that the current wave of, of, of protest has occurred during the, in our, during the administration of an African-American president, and sure. a lot of people find that puzzling. Yeah, well, it's uh, one of the themes that we have to deal with, and it's something I think that we're all acutely aware of, is that within the African-American community, to paraphrase Dickens, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Since 1970, the, the size of the black upper middle class has quadrupled. The percentage of black people making over $100,000 a year has quadrupled since 1970. The percentage of black people making over $75,000 a year has doubled. That's great, best of times, right? Why? Because of affirmative action. But the percentage of black children living at or beneath the poverty line in 1970 was just over 40%. And according to the 2010 census, it was 38%, the worst of times. It's a paradox. Dr. King would have thought that, and that generation, that if you, if you and I were on this stage and Barack Obama was in the White House, 
my God, there's some kind of revolution that had taken place, right? That if the black upper middle class had quadrupled, in other words, then the percentage of black people in poverty would have decreased by the same proportion. But that's not what happened. And what, why? Because of affirmative action. Many of us have read, everybody's read, um, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. I was born in 1950. I hit Yale in September 69 with 96 black men and women. The class of 66 at Yale had six black men. What, was there a genetic blip in the race and all of a sudden there are 90 smart black people mm -hmm. who existed three years later? Of course <clears throat> not. Yale had strict racist quotas. Historically, white colleges and universities, a term I prefer, had strict <laughs> racist quotas on the number of black people allowed to matriculate. And when I got to New Haven, who was there with me? Sheila Jackson Lee was in my class. Congresswoman from uh, Houston. Kurt Schmoke, first black mayor of Baltimore. I was pre-med because, you know, that's the way it was back in the day. Smart little black girls and black boys had to be doctors, right? So I was going to be a doctor. So once in a while in a lab, I'd run into a guy from Michigan. I'm trying to remember his name. It was um, Carson, I think. Was it Ben? Ben, ben Carson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over at the law school, we go to the film society. I mean, <clears throat> I'd be careful which kind of film I'm talking about. But we'd go to the, the Yale Law School Film Society, and Clarence Thomas was there. And I mean, <laughs> boy, I get it. No, 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 no. It was a diverse I didn't group. mean that. I didn't mean that. I'm just saying, Long we were part of the crossover generation. Uh -huh. And of course, Bill and Hillary were there at the law school too at the same time. Uh, no, we didn't know them. Uh, I didn't know Clarence either. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but. My point is that American society opened up at the height of the economy. Ken's masterpiece that's coming. I know it's uh, hard to imagine Ken making anything better than he's made, but he's done 18 hours on Vietnam. We had guns and butter. We had almost zero unemployment. We were fighting a war abroad, and we were fighting poverty at home. So it was easier for the American society to feel generous to say, OK, we're going to diversify historically white institutions. And that was affirmative action. But what happened within a few years, somebody woke up and said, there's enough of y'all in here already. I don't know how y'all got in here, but we're going to shut the door. And that was called Alan Bakke. It's true. And so those of us who were able to benefit from affirmative action were able to um, integrate the upper middle class and, and and the middle class, which is why I find it paradoxical. I mean, ideology, ideology um, aside, and you know this, and, and Ken's film makes this clear, we've always had great ideological diversity in the black community. We've had black Republicans, until 1964, we had a significant number of black Republicans, including Jackie Robinson. We had black Democrats. We've always been, uh, we've always been arguing. But for someone to have benefited from affirmative action, um, as much as I have, right? And then to stand at the gate and try to keep other people out, saying that somehow there were problems with affirmative action, it was un-American, they gave us an unfair advantage, I think would make a person like me, as far as I'm concerned, nobody's benefited from affirmative action more than I have. And for me to adopt that position will make me a hypocrite as big as Mr. Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm not well, ever going to be that kind of <clears throat> Do you... Do you address that in the film, though? Do you address that in the film, the rise of this counter-narrative about the black experience? And Because one of the things that sort of fascinates me in the current moment is just this completely different uh, sense of reality as it is lived by the same, you know, you know, people used to think that if you had the same facts, you'd come to the same conclusion. Right. And that is certainly, you know, we have made it very clear that that was an 18th century enlightenment conceit that clearly is not the case. Right. Right? Right. So, so do you address this? Why, what in your view accounts for this? Just people who have very similar experiences to yours and just say, well, you know, no, this, no, that, no, this. You mean within the African American yeah, within community? within the African American community. Um, I think it's complicated in the case of um, Clarence Thomas. I mean, I don't know him. I've never met him. I, I, I was in the Supreme Court once, and you know, I saw him from. We kind of nodded at each other. I find <laughs> I find it 
um, tremendously difficult to understand how anybody who could have profited personally so much from a, a policy then say it was the worst thing that ever happened to his life. Going to Yale Law School was a, a disastrous thing. This was an unfair thing to a person like him. And his buddy, his running buddy, Justice Scalia, who had the audacity to say maybe it would be better for uh, those people, I'm not, not his phrase, but to be at a school where they were more intellectually comfortable than a school like an Ivy League school that would be um, not forced to integrate, but implicitly forced to integrate because of affirmative action. I think it's part of a collective inferiority complex that is a remnant of slavery. Do you? I yeah. think, yes, I think the, I think the because, worst because, thing... Because there are people, I mean, I, I'm very interested in this whole question, again, making the connection between past and present, because, because Donald Trump keeps saying that there are black and Latino people who will support him. And on my show just last week, I had a person who many people might disagree with this, but I have interviewed people. There's Omarosa, this former uh, oh, person sure. on The Apprentice. Yeah. Yeah. There was this pastor, Mark Burns, who mm -hmm. was, um, has, you know, was quoted over the weekend introducing a Trump rally saying that Bernie Sanders should accept Jesus and that that's who are all African, who's an African-American minister. Right. You know, Omarosa has multiple degrees from Howard University. Um, and they're supporting him. So I'm just interested in, you know, I, you know, not to well, but that's names, different. but these are public figures, so I feel like it's okay. Sure. No, that's so. fine. The, no, that's different. I was, at, at first, I, I thought you were talking about why would a black person... No, I'm talking more broadly about of, people who have embraced this sort of alternate narrative of the black experience, of which I think Clarence Thomas is but one. He's I, well, not the only one. No, but I think that Donald Trump... Um, you know, I, I sit around talking trash with my buddies up, up at Harvard. I have dinner every Sunday with Larry Bobo, the great sociologist, and his wife, Marcelina Morgan, who's the founder of the Hip Hop Archive. And we argue all the time, right? And Larry and I team teach a course called Intro to Afro. The kids call it Blackness 101. <laughs> and it is about the great the debates in the African American tradition about what it means to be black. And we start in the 18th century. Black people have been arguing with each other over what it means to be, to be black since the day we got off, our ancestors got off the boat trying to figure out how the hell to get out of here. Now, in terms of Donald Trump, it's easier for me to understand why that support than to understand how a black person could be against affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Because so many people are afraid. There is, I found this quote, actually, somebody sent me an email this morning about would I help save James Baldwin's house in the south of France? And I went there, and, you know, that's a whole no another story, and I love James Baldwin. But I had forgotten this quote. Now, listen to this. This is from Notes of a Native Son. I imagine, James Baldwin wrote, one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Mm -hmm. They will be forced to deal with pain. And I think that um, the, the, the sense that the world has betrayed you, the sense that the world is coming undone, that um, the, your children will not do better than you and your grandchildren will not do better than their parents and that there's terrorism and there, um, there's a rise of an, uh, an economic uh, world order that is, um, we're not prepared for. I think people are, are terrified. And that Donald Trump, and I said to Larry and, and, and Marcy when, when Trump's candidacy began to manifest itself, this guy's no joke. He's smart, he's, char he's charismatic, he's very articulate, and he has the capacity to speak without the layer of metaphor. Um, you know, he just calls it the way it is. Unfortunately, unfortunately, his... I'm going to use that the next time I'm... I'm, yeah, gonna say, no. I'm speaking without the layer of metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> or, or euphemism. Mm -hmm. And that is speaking to, directly to a lot of people who are afraid. Unfortunately, he looked at the circumstances of our fellow citizens, did his analysis, and went for the lowest common denominator. He went to, he decided to appeal to the worst in, in, us. in our, our, the collective American experience, and not, as Ken is fond of saying, quoting Lincoln, to our the better angels, but to the demonic forces that um, I think cause nightmares to people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go to the next set of clips because the reason I want to do that is that one of the things that a lot of people are talking about now is 
the role of the media in, in, mm. in allowing these narratives to go forward, right. in both in what is included and what is left out. Just, just, lo ahead. just look at this. Um, we have fed Donald Trump, and we have fed him continually, not with the so-called earned media, but in fact, there is a net loss of Mexicans. There are more Mexicans leaving than are coming over, but mm -hmm. we want to build a wall. No one in any of the debates has, a has, has brought that fact, that inconvenient fact to him, that those Mexicans who do come over commit crimes at about one-third the per capita of the, re the Americans that are already here. So we're already dealing with this counterfactual mm -hmm. counter-narrative. And so it's no wonder that we're disturbed. And I think one thing that we, we've talked about before that has to be brought in is this question of class. Because it isn't just race, it's also, you know, of, of the f six officers on trial for the murder of Freddie Smith in Baltimore, three are African-American. Freddie Gray. Fre Freddie Gray. Freddie Gray. Freddie I mean, Gray. Are, uh, are African-American. And we've got, you know, situations. So it's not... It's not unusual. In fact, I'm not disturbed by finding that they're African Americans supporting Donald Trump. I, I think we're going to find the entire insane rainbow of those things. I think we have to, we have to actually look at the way in which race and racism, which is probably the more important subject, interplays with class and money. Because we have had, for the entire history of our republic, uh, it has been in the interests of the powers that be that make sure that particularly poorer whites were opposed to mm -hmm. blacks and Latinos and others, that they could say quite incorrectly that these people are eating off your plate. And particularly at a period of abundance, you can maybe be expansive enough to have an affirmative action. And that was a but, way of becoming white. And that was a way of becoming white, to join in. But now when things are a little bit tighter, when we're not sure, when we do have that anxiety, and we do want to postpone the, the hurt and the pain, the internal hurt and the pain that James Baldwin was talking about, then we will invent the ways in which we, these are the enemies of us. And so what we have done is perpetuate. God, you know, forbid for the powers that be that those people suddenly wake up and realize that for generations you have been voting against your self-interest and that if you broke bread and made common cause with African Americans and with Latinos and other, you would create a revolution in this country that would change everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, but, but this, it's interesting to me because this next set of clips that, that, um, that you all chose, or that your folks chose, speaks to this whole question of myth-making. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why I'd like to play. I don't know that we're going to get to all the clips just because we're, we're chatting. You're the so boss. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll take it. It's your show. I will show. take that. Mm -hmm. I will take that, too. So, but I would like to play. <laughs> <laughs> I would... I've had shows taken, I've had shows given, so I, yeah. I'll take that. Um, let's play this set of clips because this mm -hmm. is about the whole question of yes. myth making. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. The story goes that the Dodgers went to Cincinnati, which was one of the two most southern cities on the circuit, and it was also very close to the home of Pee Wee Reese, who grew up in Kentucky, and that Robinson was taking horrible, horrible abuse there from the fans, people calling him nigger, shouting death threats, and that in the middle of this shower of abuse, Pee Wee Reese stepped across the field, dramatically put his arm around Jackie Robinson, and sent this message to the fans and to his own teammates and to the opposing team that Robinson was one of us. And today it's remembered in statues, in children's books, but I don't think it happened. We don't know that this ever happened. We don't know when it happened. It is likely that if it happened, it didn't happen in 1947 because Reese would have had to have traipsed across the diamond to first base to throw his arm around Jackie. And even if there were evidence for it, how much are we to congratulate a person for behaving properly? There was no mention of the gesture that year in either the white or black press. When they decided to make a statue of Jack and Pee Wee with his arm on Jack's shoulder, I asked them not to do it and told them I had a better picture that I would like them to make a statue of, of the two of them. When they were coming off the field and their hands touched, and I thought, this is the way we want to present that relationship between that black man and that white man, as partners. 
and no one would buy it. We want to feel like white people have something to do with this, that we were open-minded, that we saw what was right, and we wanted to make it happen. And Pee Wee Reese is our symbol for that. We all want to be the one who's wise enough to see that we can do better as a country. So the, the myth serves a really nice purpose. Um, unfortunately, it's a myth. Progress was taking place in ways that I could glimpse, but not yet fully understand. I think it's important to point out that the actual policies that were enacted in response to the civil rights movement are actually creating more open spaces. So black folks are more a part of society, like literally are coming out of the shadows. Uh, our voting can move around in public spaces in different ways. Because of that movement, so much has happened. Because of that movement, people have a seat at the table. Because of that movement and the heroes and the sheroes of that movement, America has changed for the better. In essence, the victories of the civil rights movement meant that African Americans were equal before the law. And finally given the chance, we were making significant gains. Some were economic. By the late 1960s, the percentage of black families living in poverty was dropping. Unemployment was decreasing. And black incomes were rising at the fastest rate in history. But many of the most visible gains were cultural. Black culture was permeating mainstream American culture like never before. You could hear it in music, see it in advertising. Oh, I don't use just mouthwash, I use Listerine. And even watch it on television. When I was a kid, it was extremely rare to see any black people on TV. I remember how excited my whole neighborhood got any time an African-American appeared, even in a minor part. When Bill Cosby got a starring role on I Spy back in 1965, we were ecstatic. And by the late 1960s, we started to see more shows with black stars and black co-stars. Then, in 1971, there was a show made just for us. Soul Train, 60 non-stop minutes across the tracks of your mind into the exciting world of soul. And now, uh, welcome aboard for another super hip ride on the Soul Train. Created and hosted by visionary entrepreneur Don Cornelius, Soul Train brought black music, dancing, and fashion into homes all across America. Back then, when I finally got my Afro at 16, Soul Train, I know all of the dances. Mm -hmm. Don Cornelius, he had the presence to show us how to live our best lives. We wish you love, peace, and soul. Hey. <laughs> You know you want to do it. <laughs> Let's do it. You know you want to do it. Come on, yeah, you know you yeah. want to do it. We should you love. Yeah. Peace. And so. so. <laughs> I feel better now. But, uh, but, okay. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> There are people who will say at one point, it's it, it, so many interesting things about this. You know, the top selling genres of music in the United States, right, are right. country, country, and hip hop. Right. Okay. But at one point, and then people say, well, that's fine, but then you've got this whole toxic element of the culture, and when do we get to talk about that? Right? Mm hmm. Well, but what do you, the top, I'm not following, well, toxic I mean, I'm element of, of American an element culture? Of the, no, of, of the culture that has then become sort of mainstream. Like when Don Imus said what he said about the young ladies from the Rutgers basketball team, what did oh, he sure. say? I'm just talking the way they talk. Well, I I'm think, just, no, but right? I think that this is related to um, the concept of myth making mm -hmm. that you were alluding to. That, um, and it ties into something that Ken said earlier. The... The, the biggest myth um, was that somehow black people were subhuman. Mm -hmm. The biggest myth of America was that somehow we were a breed apart, that we do not descend from common ancestors with Europeans, that somehow in the, um, in the history of the development of um, the animal species 
that our first cousins were apes and not Europeans, right? And why was this done? It was done to economically oppress us. It was done to create the fiction that um, we were commodities, that in slavery, slavery was the merger of race and class. You are a racialized commodity. And the reason that was done was to create a huge free labor pool so that this country could realize its great promise. And to do that, they had to create a myth that somehow we were not fully human beings. And that myth is the myth that we have to fight against even today, every day, every day. I was, I was raised to my father and my mother said to my, my brother, Dr. Paul Gates, chief of dentistry at Bronx Lebanon Hospital. They said, you, we have to be 10 times smarter than white boys and white girls. Because otherwise... You forgot the rest of it. You gotta be 10 times as good, or twice as good to get half as, half as, as much. much. Half as far. And that's very much a, a leitmotif of, of Jackie Robinson. And we still live with that legacy. When you walk into a room, what's the first thing that people see? Do you think? Do they see you as a woman? They see you as a black person? They see you as a, a brilliant journalist? What do you see? For me, someone my age, I'm still aware that we have to refute stereotypes, that we have to refute these myths about us. And when Ken says, if you look at the website with this marvelous clip of the president and, and Mrs. Obama, and what do you, what do you see in terms of uh, commentary? a repetition of the same myths that hit uh, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth 100, 150 years ago. Talk, talk a little bit more about the, the sort of the myth making. I think many people, Ken, is one of the, your great series on the Civil War is one that I think for many people is the seminal work. For many people, it was when the South lost the war that the myth making became well, the, well, we, the alternate reality of history really That's exactly. Took I mean, it's, over. it's always popular to say that the victors write the history, but in the case of uh, the United States and the Civil War, the losers wrought the history. Uh, Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind propose an upside down version of the past. They suggest that a homegrown terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, still in the news, uh, were responsible for rescuing this dire situation at the end of the Civil War. It goes all the way back uh, to. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia. He considered it his, one of his finest works in, in which that proposes that black people perspire differently. They, they have different glandular systems and this accounts for their And they were not inability. intelligent. And, and they, they were, they were and, not and intelligent. And this was all to prove the point mm -hmm. that, that you could commodify commodify mm -hmm. race, and that's, that's a hugely important thing, and the guilt that comes out of that metastasizes as often into anger and violence towards mm -hmm. as it does into atonement and doing that. So, Michelle, what happens is I think that we live in a, a world with way too much information. You, as you alluded to the Enlightenment, where someone like Thomas Jefferson could have read most of the books available if he spoke as he did several languages. But what we have now is a kind of uh, sanitized Madison Avenue, whitewashed version of our history. And so for the case of Jackie Robinson, it was important in almost every area that all of the rough edges be smoothed out. So the early biography of the attacks in Pasadena on his house and the crosses and the neighbors who threw stones and Jack threw the stones back isn't part of the narrative. You know, there was a pool in Pasadena that had what they called International Day, so that uh, every <laughs> Wednesday uh, the the blacks, the few blacks and, and Latinos and uh, Asians could swim in the pool, at which point the city fathers reassured the white citizens, <laughs> the good drain. white citizens, they drain the pool, <laughs> clean it, and then fill it up for the other six days when it was available only to the white population. That we have to, in order to understand Jackie Robinson, we have to give him a white babysitter. He has to only be the product of the imagination of Branch Rickey, who's going to also coach him into how he's going to behave. You're going to mm -hmm. turn the other cheek. That he's going, we're going to need to signal what's right and wrong in America by having a white Southerner who said he'd never even shook hands with a black man 
-hmm. until he met Jackie Robinson, put his arm around him, which didn't happen, mm -hmm. in order to sort of do that. I made a film on Jack Johnson, which got the first African-American heavyweight champion Great called film. Unforgivable Blackness, after a comment W.E.B. Du Bois made about him. And, and we turned that into a Pulitzer Prize-winning Broadway play, but it was called Great White Hope. And what it postulated underneath, what the subtext was, is that in order to be this successful black boxer, he needed white brains to help him. Well, Jack Johnson mm -hmm. didn't need anyone's brains. He's a great writer. He owned three patents at the U.S. Patent Office. He just wasn't going to buy into anybody else's version of how he should live. He was going to live and sleep with whoever he wanted, and he did, and it got him in trouble. And mm -hmm. when he couldn't, when the, when the white people couldn't bring enough great white hopes, and he defeated them all, what did they do? They went in the courts and defeated him in the courts and, and ginned him up on the man act. Mm -hmm. so, how, how does the myth-making work now in your view? I mean, one of the things we were talking about Here's backstage what, before we got yes. here was you talked about like the superficiality of the media. Well, and we how, haven't we I haven't mean, covered you, you it. We have a truth-making moment and we, then it moves on. It, we, that's your, it. We don't ever. We, we are in. You know, we're sort of butterflies. We flit from every single thing, and so we don't stop to consider a substance. But we've got you know all of these different tropes. I'd say right now the word that disturbs me most is the word that's frequently used by Donald Trump, which is political correctness, in which we understand that that is bad, which is a mm -hmm. way of sort of saying to the mob. Like you're saying, sick him. Mm -hmm. That's what. That's what you know. And we are burdened. You know. I guess it's it's not politically correct to say this, which is basically giving permission to take off layers of civilization and return us to a kind of tribal state. And so you know, it's bad. And that myth making is going on a lot. But what? But. I I, I couldn't agree more. But I also think, though. Um, that it's important that we're not guilty of demonizing the people, people who, support who, who support Donald Trump. I mean, the people, that's why I read the, the James Baldwin quote. People were terrified. You've been terrified before. Um, you know, you, you can be spoken to one way or another. Donald Trump has chosen to speak to a segment of our collective psyche, a segment of our population, with one language. I'm hoping... Uh, it looks like it's going to be Hillary. Full disclosure, I support Hillary Clinton. She's a, a, a friend. I want her to be the next president of the United States. But I think that her analysis, we should look at the same group of people, the same set of circumstances, and speak to them in a rhetoric that brings us together. Speaks in, in, to them in a rhetoric that, uh, to use her phrase and the, the commonly used phrase, builds bridges and doesn't divide us. Because the fear is not going to go away unless it is, well, it'll take one form or it'll take another form. Right. And, I, and as, as Ken said earlier, when we talk about the history of this myth-making, part of it, why, why has so much energy been spent on demonizing right. the image of the black, on demonizing black people? When you go to the Jim Crow Museum, there are tens of thousands of these racist postcards. Why? To keep the people who are most exploited in this society, right. black and white, from realizing that their best common interest, their best with friend, each other. is with the person who is equally exploited, but just with a different color of face. And believe me, if they ever join hands and link up, there's going to be the biggest transformation in this society that we've ever had. A couple questions I wanted to talk to you about, though. We, we've actually been mentioning again that you are invited to join our conversation. You can join the conversation on Twitter at BAM underscore Brooklyn and Burns Gates, hashtag Burns Gates. But people have already been uh, sending in questions and comments over the course of the day. And a couple things that, you know, there are a couple things that occur to me for, as a result of what we're talking about here. First of all, as writers and as f filmmakers, we've, you know, all done these things. We've caused pain by what we've included. We've caused pain by what we've left out. We have a couple of people who've written in to say, why are we still discussing race in a binary fashion, black, white, mm -hmm. um, until we're able to talk about the variety of races that are and have been part of the fabric of the U.S. for generations. Remember that the southwestern U.S. was once part of Mexico. Uh, so uh, this lack of inclusion of these people on, which should be obvious, 
it continues to be disheartening. I'm, I'm editing a little bit for time. Sure. It leaves out what's increasingly a larger percentage of the population of this country. I wanted to put that question to both of you. And also, yeah. we have another question from a woman who says, what do you think? I, I disagree with the premise, because I think, but I'm going to read it to you. She says, why do you think nothing has been written about Asian Americans who've contributed so much to American history? Are they too quiet and unassuming? No, so I, I, let, let me, because in, in the body of my work, we've dealt with all of those issues. But I am particularly fascinated by race because it is the American original sin. There is only one group of people who have the peculiar experience of being unfree in a free land, and that's African Americans. And they inherit a, a, a sort of memory. You know, people like to say that our great genius as, as Americans is improvisation. We do have the shortest uh, constitution, only four pieces of paper in the history of the world. It's still the operating manual that we, that we subscribe to. But if you're unfree in a free land, you've got to improvise a hell of a lot more than anybody else. And I think the disturbances of our country are admittedly about a whole range of diversity, and we've covered them in many, many films. We did a history of the West in which we decided to forego uh, the traditional stories of the gunslingers and the mythology of the Jesse James and Bat Masters. It's in favor of a Hispanic and Asian narrative uh, that is part of the history of our West and all of the Russians and Chinese for whom that was the East and for for the white Americans, it was the West, and for the Brits, it was the South, and for the Hispanics, it was the North, and for, very importantly, 300 different separate nations, it was home. And that's been an important part of our work. But I think, time and time again, the disturbances, the, the kinds of things we've been talking about tonight that are based in race and racism, um, it's not to say that it's not extended and we're not limiting it in any way, but I think, I, I remember something, and I said this the other night, that Wynton Marsalis said to me in our 2001 series on the history of jazz when I asked him about race. And he, um, he said, race is, and he stopped and he just closed his eyes in, in extraordinary pain and he clenched his fist and he looked up to heaven for inspiration and he said, race is, it's, you know, it's like the thing in the mythology that the kingdom needs in order to be well. Mm -hmm. It's something we should be running towards, but we're always running away from. And what he was postulating is that jazz, and it's incredibly ecumenical and generous and democratic spirit, permitted a kind of call and response that allowed the tensions, say, between black and white to coexist, the tensions between Saturday night and Sunday morning to coexist and be reconciled. And so what we look for in our narrative is a place where one in one doesn't always add up to the safe and rational too, but we look for as we do in our life, in our sex, in our relationship, in our faith, in our art, for that strange and improbable calculus where one in one equals three. Uh, slavery Skip. was um, as horrible, uh, you know, so monumentally horrible, it's difficult to find language to describe the nature and function and import of slavery, but we can never forget that the enslavement of African Americans and the shipping of 12.5 million Africans across the Atlantic between, say, 1515 and 1866 was built on the uh, attempt to completely annihilate the people, the genocide of the people who owned America in the first place, the Native Americans. And we need to hammer that fact home, and we forget it. And Native Americans are still living with the consequences of, right. of, that, um, of that genocide. And it's, it's something that we can't, it's a story that's not told enough. Um, a story that we bracket, I think, because of the depth of our shame um, exactly. about it. Well, there, there's a question to you also, Skip, about that. And th this question's about finding your roots and the controversy about Ben Affleck, finding out that slave owners were in his family. Generally, his reaction was to distance himself from that. It seems like an allegory for how America writ large deals with race. We act as though it was a long time ago. We can't possibly be racist now. Is this imagining racism is limited to individual actions and its structural impact? And the, the question goes on. But that, that does raise a question of, I understand that you said that you took that out because it was repetitive to other storylines. Mm -hmm. um, but doesn't that kind of reinforce the idea that this is just a series of bad actors as opposed to something that touched so many Americans that it is a part of the fabric. Oh, no, that's a great question. We had eight stories in that series about slavery. And I was, um, Ken's treatment of the Civil War is fascinating to me and the role of the Civil War 
Well, one thing, one story that we never talk about enough is the fact that Ken is, was pointing out yesterday, we were together two days ago, two days ago when we were together, that 750,000 Americans died in, in the Civil War. And one of the traumas of that much death was, um, well, the response was spiritualism. Right. The growth of the, the belief that somehow, the only way that you could process that was to believe that basically your ancestors were in another room and that there was a person who could be the transport between you and that other room. One of Ben Affleck's ancestors became a medium. And so I wanted to tell the story of slavery in the Civil War through that unusual story. It's as simple and as complex as that. And we had eight other stories about um, slavery. You the mistake I made was... But it was what, what was your mistake? Um, not talking to uh, Paula Kerger at PBS and asking her an opinion about it. But he but, was upset about it. That was the way it was well, reported, yeah, that but he I, was upset. Uh, and, so, and it's upsetting. People are upset when you share with them things about themselves that they would perhaps wish well, were not true. And, and, and we could talk to, to Ken about <laughs> that because I had, well, this is very interesting yes. about, um, about the weight of um, an unpleasant story. Yeah. And it's your story, so you tell, I told him two unpleasant stories about himself. You tell me, you, would you mind So I had had my this? genealogy. I had been interested, as you could imagine, mm -hmm. uh, in my genealogy all my life and had been trying to find a connection to the poet Robert Burns that my grandmother insisted existed and no one could find. And in fact, there's a question about that. And, Are you related to Robert Burns? I am indeed. Oh, would some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us, which is the whole point of this conversation. Mm -hmm. He said in To Allow Us, which is a wonderful poem. I commend it to everybody. Um, but I'd learned a lot in previous genealogical expeditions, but Skip brought to me uh, several things. He connected me to Robert Burns finally through some very complex mitochondrial DNA research, which I, I, I particularly uh, was pleased about. But there were two moments where I knew that I had Southerners uh, in my blood, and I'd known uh, my great-great-grandfather Abraham Burns fought in Captain McClanahan's company of Virginia horse artillery and was captured in August of 1863 in what is now Moorefield, West Virginia, and held captive at Camp about, Chase. About but, uh, 20 miles from where I was born and right near where skip is from so mm -hmm. we're kind of well let's Kiss not, so anyway well it, it gets a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that maybe but uh, he he revealed to me that I was a, a slave owner and it did not I mean that I had ancestors that were slave owners and I <laughs> yeah you know, I think we'd have found out I by think now. I'm going to leave now um, <laughs> And that I had, and it, it, it didn't shock me one bit, one bit, because I've been dealing with this. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about the mythology. I mean, the mythology that's even more pernicious than the Ku Klux Klan is that somehow that African Americans were passive bystanders to the Civil War instead of the active, dedicated, mm -hmm. self sacrificing soldiers they were in this intensely personal drama of self liberation. That's an extraordinary story and ought to be included, and we tried to do it. What really bothered me, the bad news that he really bought, is that on my mother's side, there's a guy. Mm -hmm. named, and you know, I'd heard about him before from some other research, didn't know anything about him, named Eldad Tupper. I thought, what a great name, we're getting a dog, let's name him Eldad. <laughs> Until Skip broke the worst news that I'd ever had, is that he was a Tory, that he fought for the Brits <laughs> in the revolution, I had to leave and go to see. He almost died. I almost died on the spot, you know, and he <laughs> redeemed me by giving the last thing was, you know, he tortures you in this thing, and the last thing after four hours on the, on the stand there was that <laughs> he was gonna give me Robert Burns, but it, it's interesting. I'm an American. I've got all of this stuff in me. You know, and he pointed out what the ancestor, I got 1% sub-Saharan African, which means somewhere along the line, somebody's mm -hmm. fooling around. And I've got, and I've got uh, 1% uh, East Asian, which means that one of those Tuppers in Massachusetts were responsible for Indians. Something was going on there. Sure. And so, and, and these are really small percentages. I've, I've tried to, in all of my work, try to represent this question, who are we? And obviously, like James Baldwin's statement, the who are we is a very convenient set of armor that permits us to avoid saying, all of us, mm -hmm. including me, 
who am I? Mm -hmm. And I think what, what the reason why we're drawn so inexorably to Skip's series is that who am I is just, you are naked there. You are who you are. The sum total of all of this genetic memory, all of these ancestors, and since we're all imperfect, you know, we live in a world in which we somehow expect everybody to be heroes and think because no one's perfect, there are no heroes, which is ridiculous, because heroes are always the, the war between positive forces and negative forces within a person. Achilles had his heel and his hubris. Mm. You know, this is why we're drawn to this. We find out about us. I, I found it sublime to have just the awareness that I contained, as Whitman said, multitudes. Sure. And, you know, the only thing that pissed me off was just Eldad. <laughs> Goddamn Eldad. Well, and... and, and A Tory. And, <laughs> and when you, you think about myth-making, and it's something that I'm sure you're aware of, um, most African-Americans, if we turn the lights up, which I'm not going to ask you to do, and I ask every African-American in here who was raised to, uh, to believe that their great-great-grandmother had high cheekbones and straight black hair <laughs> and was therefore a Native American, everybody would raise their hand virtually. Um, but when you look at the DNA evidence, less than 1% of the African-American people have any significant amount of Native American ancestry. But the average African American has 24% European ancestry. And where does that come from? That comes from slavery. That comes from rape and forced, uh, cajoled sexuality. And we have chosen, when I did Chris Rock, yeah. I asked Chris Rock, he was so disappointed because he didn't have any significant Native American ancestry. And, <laughs> I said, why? And he said, because it's easier, and it was easier for our ancestors to create a myth that your ancestor ran away from the plantation over the hill, found solace with Native Americans, smoking the peace pipe. The chief says, oh, you're a fine African American. Why don't you pick one of our, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, not that it never happened, but it almost never happened. There's and, a woman, there's a, interesting, there's a woman who wrote in about this um, and said that uh, 13 years ago I had my son in a hospital in Queens. My husband and I are both dark-skinned black Americans. My son came out fair-skinned with a head of shiny straight hair. The night maternity nurse was African American. The next evening she brought my son to me for a feeding. I burst into tears and said, this baby doesn't look like my husband or I. She said, oh child, that's slavery. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Yeah. She said, don't worry, he'll darken up. I'm not sure why, but I found it terribly unsettling that I might not be what I thought I was. So my question is, are black Americans finding through DNA that we have white ancestry, what does that mean for us? It means that we have, there, there has, up until recently, not, we used three DNA companies <clears throat> in finding your roots. And none of those companies, until recently, had ever tested an African American no matter how phenotypically African, quote unquote, who was 100% African American until, I mean 100% of African. African ancestry. This measures, for those of you who don't know, your ancestry back 500 years. It's called the admixture test. And not one had tested an African American who was 100% uh, Sub-Saharan African because of slavery. So that not only are we experientially um, intertwined, we are genetically intertwined. That, but, the, but, but then this is a country in which people owned their own children. They know that. They oh, know sure. that they did. And so no, they sold. The, sold their own children. Right. The wedding so vows we were changed this. till death or distance do you part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, and the, the perversion of, do you follow the condition of the father, condition yes. of the mother? You follow the condition of, of the mother. Why? Because the overwhelming percent of interracial um, liaisons were white males and black well, females that, who were owned. That goes me back. To, that goes back to the question I asked you at the beginning of our conversation, both of you, which is, does this information matter? Do people care? Because really and truly, we are talking about family. We are family. Right. We are indeed related. I have never had, um, and you know the series when we track down, we do our best to track down the the names of your enslaved ancestors and then the white people who own them. And sometimes through DNA, several times, we have found a match that we know that you are descended from the white man who owned your ancestors. That, in effect, was your great-great-grandfather. And, and so I show the, the picture where we have a, or a portrait. And a few times we've said, would you like to meet your white cousin? And never 
has an African-American said no? Even knowing that most likely the reason that white ancestor is in their family tree is because of rape. What about the other way? The other way, but for- What, does a white cousin want to meet their black cousin? Yeah, we have, um, the only time, no, the, we've, we've never tried to arrange a meeting when a white person said no. But Jeffrey Canada, whom you know, and you all know um, the Harlem Children's Zone, um, we thought it was reasonable that he might be descended from this slave owner. Mm -hmm. And we tracked, we traced um, a man and a woman. The woman was in Georgia, I think, and the man was in Virginia or, or vice versa. And it was the other way around. And so we, we talked to the man, the producers called, we tried, he said he was not interested in taking a DNA test to prove whether his, his ancestor, you know, actually fathered a child with um, an, an enslaved human being, a black woman. And then, so we found this, his sister. And the sister loved Oprah. I sent her the article, I mean, sent her the, the, uh, the episode with Oprah in it. I called her, and I was really nice. And I said, we're not trying to embarrass anybody. Jeffrey Canada just wants to know if this man was his uh, great-great-grandfather. And um, I waited, and I waited, and waited. I think um, our producer, I think it was Jesse Sweet, and he could be here in the audience. And um, he tried, and I called her, and she said, um, Dr. Gates, um, I've decided no. And I said, well, can I ask you why? And she said, it would embarrass my daddy. And I was thinking, damn, your daddy's dead. You know, <laughs> you know I didn't yeah. want to say that. I didn't want to say that. She said, she said, no, it would embarrass my, my father. It would embarrass my family um, to know that. And, and she had the DNA to prove or, or, or disprove. Let, let, let me... Let me bring a couple, couple short stories. Uh, one, Briefly, because I want to uh, do one more well, set of clips well, one, before we one, go. One is at the oh, heart good. of our yeah. national mythology, which is Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Mm -hmm. So Sally Hemings is the product of, uh, he inherited a lot of slaves when his father-in-law died, his wife's father, and one of them was a woman who had fathered a child with uh, Mrs. Jefferson's father and produced Sally Hemings. And, and Jefferson's wife died. Jefferson, and, in other words, Jefferson's wife and Sally Hemings, Hemings were half sisters. Were half sisters. So and after they his wife alike. died, they looked like, and he looked every day at this woman and, with who, the sun tan. His wife does, with the sun tan. His wife with the sun tan, and they and they fathered, we believe, six children together. That's at the heart of our formation, our creation myth. The guy who wrote our catechism. We have that in our blood. So which makes us, as you suggested earlier, in our family. Two nights ago, when we finished um, something at George Washington University, there was backstage a, a brief reception, and two men came up. To to me, um, both uh, one African American, one white, and um, they were both sort of on the verge of tears. And they brought some paperwork. They had the same last name, and they were related to each other. They had, through generations ago, on an Alabama plantation, mixed. The names had sort of stayed, and mm -hmm. they had been reunited. And now they had found each other's soulmate. They were two brothers, literally, and it was one of the nicest postscripts we've had to these. We've had some extraordinary encounters and great and challenging questions and extraordinary sort of attention given to what is a difficult subject. But I, I felt last night, or two nights ago, that mm. that, that had sort of, there yeah. were men, and, and, and both men were close to tears mm -hmm. as they described the, the intimacy with which they had now connected and, and had become brothers. And I thought I saw, for a glimpse of just a second, of, of the possibilities of where we could go. Mm. The thing that animated Skip's passion at the beginning of our conversation about, about what we have to do. You have to keep going. You have to look forward. You have to rise up. Mm -hmm. what, what would you like to conclude with? We could conclude with Million Man March, or we could conclude with Black Lives Matter. There's the whole, what, what, you, what would you two like to conclude with? We don't have time to do both. What do you think? Um, Black Lives Matter. You want to do Black Lives Matter? So can we skip? They, um, there's some very interesting meditation on uh, masculinity, but you'll have to watch the films. So there it is. <laughs> and let's, can we go to clip five? Are we ready? I'm not sure. Can we go? You can Thumbs do whichever up? one. Okay. Here. One day, we had a birthday party for Pee Wee at Ebbets Field. In the fifth inning, the game was halted, and he's going to get a car. We gave him awards. 
and we sang happy birthday. And while the lights were down, the ground crew went on top of Evans Field and ran up a small Confederate flag in his honor because he was from Louisville, Kentucky. We owned a clubhouse after the game, and Jackie is irate. I mean, he was livid. Who would ever let Jim Crow back in the ballpark? I think it's very difficult for many people to understand the indignities that a black person had to endure. And Jackie Robinson was a man who had an incredible amount of race pride. and. Uh, saw no reason why he should have to endure indignities of that sort. On August 9th, 2014, a police officer shot and killed 18-year-old Michael Brown during an altercation in Ferguson, Missouri. The conflicting accounts of what led to the shooting have never been reconciled. But regardless of the circumstances, the sight of Brown's body lying in the street for hours was an outrage. The picture of his body in the street is being tweeted and they still haven't removed it. Why is this happening? Why is this boy lying dead in the street? Black communities know what it means when a black kid is killed by somebody that is white with power and the body is left there to terrorize the community. You took my son away from me. You know how hard it was for me to get him to stay in school and graduate. You know how many black men graduate? Not many. Because you bring them down to this type of level where they feel like I don't got nothing to live for anyway. Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! After residents gathered to protest the killing, the police response shocked the country. It looked more like a scene from war-torn Iraq than a suburb in Missouri. It was the tanks that made everybody pay attention. Conservative white folks, Republicans and Democrats and white people across the spectrum saying, why do you have a tank in Ferguson, Missouri? Why are the police in military riot gear? You must disperse the area immediately. You are in violation of the state imposed curfew. The police had every type of machinery you could ever have, and we got tear gassed. I'm getting tear gassed in an American street fighting for the police not to kill people, and I was like, this just isn't okay. And I'm just one of many who like stopping silent because of because of what happened in August. DeRay McKesson, a former math teacher, was appalled by what he saw on the streets of Ferguson. He left his job to become a full-time activist, joining a rising groundswell of outrage, unified by a simple but powerful slogan. We know black lives matter the way all lives matter, but unfortunately in America, you got to say black lives matter because when you say all lives matter, oftentimes you don't get to the black lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, thank you thank for your you. work and thank you both for your work. Um, we're down to our last couple of minutes, and this is obviously a story which continues to be written. Both of these stories continue to be written in ways that I think continue to surprise some of us yes. uh, and shock some of us, but don't surprise and yeah. shock some of us, um, yeah. given the body of work that each of you's done. So I'd like just to ask each of you to take a couple of minutes to give us whatever closing thoughts you would like us to have. I think we started with talking about the power of symbolism and I think a lot of us are, you know, intrigued by the fact that we're still talking about things like the Confederate flag and so forth. So do you want to start? And then sure, I'll, I'll do you start. Want to start. I think that um, the biggest problem that, the thing that I worry about the most is that the class divide in America, which is so stark and so pronounced, will become permanent unless those of us who genuinely care about equality, equality of race, but also equality of class, say enough is enough. 
and a small group of people cannot make such a phenomenal amount of money at the expense of the welfare of regular, good-hearted, working-class people who are now being manipulate, manipulated by um, demagogic language but through a candidate appealing to their fears. And unless we as a society decide that equity and fairness um, are values that, that we are going to fight for, just as we fought for, you know, as we fight against racism, we fight against um, uh, anti-Semitism and uh, homophobia, et cetera. Unless we decide that class um, really is the great evil, one of the great evils still confronting American society, I think that we're headed for a very bad time in the immediate and long-term future of America. Ken Burns. I've always been drawn and, and continually surprised by the power of history. You know, we've, most of us, history is a subject that we're told that we, is good for us, but hardly good tasting, a kind of castor oil, mm -hmm. and not the great pageant that everything ha that has come before this moment, this moment. And I'm always struck by how contemporary it seems. William Faulkner is famous for saying, history is not was, but is. Harry Truman said, the only thing that's really new is the history you don't know. And I've spent my entire professional life delving into stories because I knew they had a kind of urgent contemporariness. At the same time, they may be describing periods, decades, uh, before even centuries uh, before. You know, in, for my own work, in trying to deal and ask this question about who are we, the complicated republic that we think we are, and all of those people, and, and perhaps either ignore or listen to the who am I part of it that, that is really real and that kind of inner, outer conversation. I'm, I'm reminded after the Civil War, you know, the veterans would complain one-fifth of the entire budget of the state of Mississippi in 1866 went to artificial limbs, um, that, that the soldiers would complain that they could feel those limbs long after they were missing, they tingled. And, and history's a little bit like that. And I, th I think on an evening like tonight, as we, we conclude, at least for now, a kind of long-running conversation about this, uh, I, I realize how much I miss people. They're missing people right now. Um, I was 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I played with guns in my backyard. And no cop came up and shot me within two and a half seconds of his arrival. Um, I'm alive. But Tamir Rice isn't, and I miss him. Um, Trayvon Martin is not here, but if he'd been a white kid in a, in a hoodie walking through that neighborhood, uh, he'd still be alive. And so, you know, we have an opportunity, I think, to uh, open ourselves if, if it is as you suggest, and I believe it. It's true, and, and Skip has proven scientifically as well as with his... A uh, huge and capacious heart that we are all the same, that you know we are obligated to continue this conversation and to talk about how you enlarge this family and not let the demagogues narrow it and use fear to divide us. So I'm happy that this conversation can go on, but I do miss Tamir Rice and I do miss Trayvon Martin. They're missing people in our in our culture. I'm going to ask one more question, which is that. <laughs> many. Many people will be sitting here and listening to our conversation. They will be asking themselves, what can I do? And you are each teacher, each of you is a teacher, each in your own way. Um, I am not in the should business, but you are. What, uh, what should we do? <laughs> what do we do? I, I have only Frederick Douglass's advice to a young ac acolyte. Agitate, agitate, agitate. <laughs> right. okay. Amen. That's All right. it. Thank Ken you. Burns, Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, man.